So this next example is a nice little twist on that practice problem of verifying a solution to a differential equation. In this example, we're given basically the solution to our differential equation, but we have to find that missing piece. So we're asked to find the value of this constant k that makes the function y equals cosine of k times x plus sine of k times x a solution to our second order differential equation y double prime plus 9y is equal to 0. So in order to find the value of k that makes this a solution to our differential equation, we're going to have to find the function and its second derivative, plug them into our differential equation. That should end up giving us some new equation that involves this unknown constant k, and hopefully we can solve that equation to find the value of k. So we know that y is equal to cosine of kx plus sine of kx. We don't really need the first derivative since it's not involved in our differential equation, but we do need it to help us find the second derivative, which is involved. So the first derivative is going to look like negative k times sine of kx, just using our chain rule, and positive k times cosine of k times x. So now that we have the first derivative, we can use that to help us find the second derivative, which we need in order to evaluate our differential equation. Differentiating one more time, again using the chain rule, gives us negative k squared times cosine of kx for that first term, and negative k squared times sine of kx for that second term. Well, now that we found y and y double prime, we can plug them into our differential equation, and hopefully this will allow us to find our unknown constant k. So what does y double prime look like? Well, we have it right here. It's negative k squared cosine of kx minus k squared times sine of kx. Then we have to add to this nine copies of our original solution or original function y. So that'll give us nine copies of cosine of kx plus nine copies of sine of kx. And so what we know is that if this is a solution to our differential equation, then all the stuff on the left-hand side is going to have to zero out and be equal to zero or the right-hand side of our differential equation. So what we have to now do is find the values of k, if there are any, that zero out all these terms on the left-hand side of our equation. And to help us maybe find the value of k that makes that happen, let's go ahead and group our like terms together. Right? We have some cosine terms, and some sine terms that we can group together. So if we factor cosine of kx out of those two terms involving cosine of kx, what we're going to be left with is a positive 9 and a negative k squared. So we can kind of start factoring our equation as cosine of kx times the quantity 9 minus k squared. We can do something similar for sine of kx. We have those two terms involving sine of kx, and the factorization is going to look very similar. If we pull out the factors of sine of kx, we're left with a positive 9 and a negative k squared. And so we need this to be equal to 0 no matter what value of x takes place. And so what that means is that cosine of kx and sine of kx are not always going to be 0. Those quantities are going to be changing. Sometimes they might be 0 for certain values of x, depending on k, but we can't guarantee that those will always be factors of 0. But if we choose the right values for k, we can guarantee that these other factors will be 0, which will eliminate the sine and cosine altogether. So our differential equation is going to be equal to 0 if and only if these factors or quantities 9 minus k squared are equal to 0. But now we can solve that little quadratic equation very quickly and find that k is equal to plus or minus 3. So the value of k that makes y equals cosine of kx plus sine of kx a solution to the second order differential equation are we could use positive 3 or negative 3 for that k value. All right, so in this example, we're actually going to solve a differential equation together. We're asked to solve the initial value problem, y double prime is equal to negative 32 with the initial conditions that if we were to evaluate the first derivative of our unknown function at 0, 
the output or the first derivative would be equal to 10. And if we were to evaluate the original unknown function, not its derivative, but the original function at x equals 0, the output or the y value that comes out would be positive 5. And this is a second order differential equation that we are being asked to solve. But you might recognize this as a differential equation you've actually solved previously at the end of like a calculus one class or maybe sometime in a calculus two class. Most differential equations will not be set up in such a nice way that we can just use integration or antiderivatives to find the solution to our differential equation. But for some of our very basic differential equations, that will be an effective approach. This problem doesn't have any context to it, but if you remember, we've probably done some examples similar to this related to projectile motion, right? We know the second derivative describes like the acceleration an object is experiencing. So this is saying the object might be experiencing a constant acceleration of like negative 32 feet per second squared. And then the first derivative is describing the initial velocity of the object and the original function, that initial condition will be describing the initial position of the object. So if that was the context to this problem, then we'd be trying to find the original position function that describes the movement of this object. So for a differential equation like this, where we just have y double prime or some derivative of y equal to some function of just x, we can just integrate both sides to help us solve our differential equation. The idea is to go from y double prime to y prime, we have to integrate y double prime but that'll give us the integral of negative 32. Well, what is the integral or antiderivative of negative 32 with respect to x? It's gonna be negative 32x plus some constant that we are gonna call c1, not just c because, well, what we're gonna see is multiple constants will show up in our process. So if the second derivative of this unknown function was negative 32, using antiderivatives and integrals, we can argue that the first derivative should look something like negative 32 times x plus some unknown constant c1. In the end, we'll be able to go and find that unknown constant c1 using the information about our initial conditions. We could do that now, but I want to leave it uh, more general for a reason you'll see soon. So now if we want to go from y prime to y, we just have to integrate y prime or find its antiderivative. And so that means we need to now find the antiderivative of negative 32x plus that constant c1. And so just using our power rule, the antiderivative of our first term is going to be negative 16x squared. The antiderivative of our second term is going to be c1 times x. And then to get the most general antiderivative or solution, we have to add on some other constant c2. And so now if we paused here and looked at our equation, our solution for the unknown function y, we know our function has to have the form negative 16x squared plus some constant times x plus some other constant that we're calling c2. And so if we were to take the time to plug this equation into our differential equation, y double prime equals negative 32, it would solve our differential equation no matter what those constants c1 and c2 are. And that is why we refer to this type of solution as the general solution. Right, we mentioned it earlier, and we'll talk about it a bit more in other sections, but there are more than one solution to a differential equation. And when we want to solve these differential equations, we want to find the most general solution, which is really a family of solutions. And so now the idea is there is more to this problem because we're asked to find a solution that also satisfies these two initial conditions. And so now if we want to work with our general solution to find the constants C1 and C2 that satisfy these initial conditions, we'll be going from the general solution to our differential equation to a particular solution to our differential equation. For instance, we know one of our initial conditions is y of 0 is equal to 5. So that means if we plug in x equals 0 into our original function y, including this general form of it, we should get 5 as the corresponding output or y value. Well, if we plug in x equals 0, those first two terms are going to vanish, and we're going to get c2. So the value of our general solution at the x value of 0 is c2, and we need that to be equal to 5. So that tells us, well, c2 has to be equal to 5. We also need to go and find c1 as well. 
And to do that, we need to look at the first derivative of our function. We know if we evaluate the first derivative of our function at 0, we should get positive 10. Well, if we go up to this line that's describing the equation for our first derivative, well, if we plug in x equals 0, we're just left with c1. So c1 must be equal to 10. In general, these unknown coefficients, c1 and c2, or these constants, will not match up perfectly with the initial conditions of 5 and 10. That was just coincidence in this case. But we will always find those constants c1 and c2 using those initial conditions. They just don't always have to correspond exactly together. And so now we know the solution to our differential equation that goes along with these two initial conditions is going to look like negative 16x squared plus c1 times x, so plus 10x plus c2 or plus 5. And so this is the overall solution to the example we are working with, and we would call this a particular solution. We talk much more about the theory behind all of this in a class like a differential equations class, but here we're just kind of getting a light introduction to everything. The idea is if we did not have these initial conditions, the most we could do is find the general solution to the differential equation, and our differential equations will have infinitely many solutions, but they're all going to be pretty similar, right? The infinitely many solutions are described by the general solution, and to go from the general solution to a particular solution, you're going to need some kind of initial conditions that help you figure out what those varying pieces like c1 and c2 could be. And once we have some type of initial conditions, there will only be one particular solution to a differential equation with initial conditions. And so this is going to be another example of a basic differential equation that we can solve just by integrating both sides or finding the antiderivative of each side of our equation. This is a special case of a more general method that we're going to look at next called separation of variables. The idea is, if we were to think of using Leibniz notation instead of this Newton or prime notation, then we could also express our differential equation as dy over dx is equal to secant of x times tangent of x. And so then what we do to actually help us find our solution using integration and antiderivatives is we treat this differential dy over dx, that derivative, as a fraction, and we clear the denominator by multiplying both sides by the differential of x. So that allows us to rewrite our differential equation as the differential of y is equal to secant of x times tangent of x times the differential of x. And then what we do is we integrate both sides of our equation. And so now what is the antiderivative of the differential of y? And you can also throw a factor of 1 in there. That makes it easier for you to see. The antiderivative of 1 with respect to y, or the antiderivative of dy, is just y itself. And then that's going to be equal to the antiderivative of secant of x times tangent of x. And well, you might have to look up your table of antiderivatives, but that antiderivative is just our secant function. Well, our secant function plus some unknown constant, c. And so we have actually finished this example. We have found the general solution to this basic differential equation. It's just our secant function plus some constant. If we did not include that arbitrary constant of integration plus c, I guess you can still see that if my hand covers it up, but if we did not include that plus c, then this would not be the general solution to our differential equation. It would be some particular solution to our differential equation.